unbelievable quote about Killian Jornet. A physiologist called him the most extraordinary human being he's ever studied. What is it? What makes him that different physiologically? Today, we're looking at the science behind Killian Jornet. Where's a good place to start unraveling this, this extraordinary physiology? Well, one thing that might surprise people is his diet. For a long time, a significant period, Killian Jornet was actually vegetarian. Vegetarian, okay. That definitely goes against some of the uh, traditional thinking for elite endurance athletes, right? right? The need for animal protein. It does. And the physiologist mentioned, you know, his earlier diet was more typical, maybe pasta, pizza. The change could be down to just better understanding or maybe access to different foods. And critically, Jornet was apparently really open to the science, willing to follow recommendations. That's key. It came up during this huge project called the Alpine Connection. You're talking 19 days straight, traversing the Alps, hitting loads of 4,000 meter peaks. It worked out to something like uh, 250 to 300 hours of physical activity. Just intense. Okay, and the diet during that? Here's the kicker. Zero animal protein for the entire 19 days. None. Seriously? And what happened? Did you waste away? Nope. No weight loss. And maybe just as importantly, no gut issues, no health problems reported. That is... That's genuinely startling. It really makes you rethink things, doesn't it? It suggests pretty strongly that a well-managed plant-based diet can support even that kind of extreme output, mm. which kind of naturally leads us to his gut, his microbiota. Ah, the gut microbiome. The physiologist seemed obsessed with it, said he knew Killian's microbiota better than anyone after, what, 20, 25 analyses. That's a lot of testing. It tells you how important they believe it is. Uh -huh. And the science is really catching up to this idea. Right. That a healthy gut is just fundamental, not just for general health, but especially for athletes. Especially endurance athletes. Gut problems are a huge limiter, something like 60 to 80% deal with them. If your gut isn't working, you can't absorb nutrients, you can't get the energy you need. It doesn't matter how good your VO2 max is if your digestion fails you halfway through a race. It's that base systemic work, like the physiologist called it, foundational health. Exactly, you need that resilience. He even broke down the types of bacteria. There are mucolytic ones, like Acromancia and Fecalobacterium. They interact with the gut lining, help activate the immune system. Then the regulatory ones, Bifidobacteria, Lactobacilli, involved in neurotransmitters, hormones, metabolism. You find those in breast milk, right? They produce things like butyrate. Correct, those beneficial short-chain fatty acids. Yeah. And then you even have pathogenic types like E. coli, which also play a role in immune modulation. It's all about the balance, you know, the ecosystem. So how does this play out in extreme conditions like the Everest acclimatization study they did? High altitude, low oxygen. They tracked his microbiota during weekly exposures up to 8,000 meters. Altitude sickness often involves Nasty gut issues, mm. diarrhea, dehydration, can't keep food down. It's a real problem up there. And what did they find in his gut during that stress? This was fascinating. In the third week, just before a summit push, when he also had some kind of virus and diarrhea, one specific pathogenic bacteria species spiked by 2,800%. Huge increase. Now, the question is, did the extreme environment cause that overgrowth, or was there maybe a slight imbalance already that made him more susceptible under stress? But either way, it just hammers home how central the microbiota is to getting sick, to adapting to your whole metabolism. Absolutely. And speaking of metabolism, let's talk lactate. Ah, lactate, the stuff that makes your legs burn and seize up, right? The waste product. Well, that's the classic view. And yes, <laughs> producing lactic acid during, say, a sprint lowers pH and affects muscle function, that's where the whole lactate threshold idea comes from. We use lactate levels to gauge training intensity, recovery needed. That's standard practice. It is. But the new thinking, the really revolutionary part, is that lactate isn't just waste. It's actually a signaling molecule, and it's fuel. Fuel? For what? For other cells, especially slow twitch muscle fibers. And yeah. get this for certain gut bacteria too, like the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria we mentioned. The gut bacteria eat lactate. Some of them do and they turn it into butyrate, which as we said, is an energy source itself, provides maybe 20% of our energy from those short chain fatty acids. So having a good population of those bacteria actually helps you recycle lactate and boost performance. Okay, mine's slightly blown. Is there data on Killian showing this in action? Oh yeah, UTMB 2022, Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc, at kilometer 150, that's after like 17 hours of running. His blood lactate measured 19.9 millimoles per liter. 19.9. Isn't that, isn't that what you'd see in a sprinter collapsing after a 400 meter race? It's an insanely high level for that duration. 
but what did Killian do? He launched an attack, broke away, and won the race. He used it. His body didn't see it as poison, it saw it as fuel. Precisely. It points to this incredible metabolic flexibility. It's not just about carbo loading, it's the ability to efficiently use everything glycogen, fats, lactate, even ketone body. Ketones too, while taking in carbs and producing lactate. Apparently so. The physiologist mentioned his blood work showing high cholesterol, high triglycerides, and ketones present alongside that massive lactate level. He was tapping into multiple pathways simultaneously. That's next level. And then yep. he recovers and runs another intense race soon after. A fast uphill race like Sierra Zenol in just three hours. It shows that this flexibility isn't just a race day trick. It's built from that fundamental base systemic level, including, importantly, that healthy gut microbiota we talked about. So going back to the Alpine Connection project, did they look at his microbiota during that 19-day no animal protein effort? They did analyzed fecal and oral samples, and the results were, again, pretty remarkable. Significantly higher levels, like five to 10 times higher than the average person of those butyrate-producing bacteria and other beneficial fermentative types. And incredible diversity overall. Plus, they found higher levels of what you might call ancestral bacteria, like Prevotella. These are linked to fermenting fiber, but they're often reduced in modern Western populations because our diets have changed, lost diversity. It paints a picture of a really robust, resilient gut ecosystem. It does. And it also serves as a warning, maybe, how modern diets, antibiotics, they can really knock back beneficial bacteria like bifidobacteria. Mm. And once they're depleted, it's hard for them to get reestablished because other bacteria have taken over that niche, like biofilm in a pipe. You know? yeah, the established ecosystem resists change. It makes you cautious about, say, super specialized race diets if they come at the cost of long-term gut health. That's a key point. You don't want to sacrifice that foundation. So this metabolic flexibility, it's not just about going full keto then. How does he seem to achieve it? doesn't seem to be strict keto, no. It's more about applying the right kind of stress, the right stimuli at the right time. Things like fasted training could play a role or strategically delaying when you eat after a workout. You're basically tapping into that physiological state created by the exercise to enhance adaptation, forcing the body to get better at using stored fuel. Fasting, heat, hypoxia, supplements. It depends on the context. Absolutely. And you have to be careful, for example, we know intense endurance exercise itself can temporarily increase gut permeability, leaky gut, essentially. Oh, right. Now, combine that exercise-induced leakiness with slugging down ultra-processed sugary gels full of additives during a long race, that could be a bit of a perfect storm for gut problems. Yeah, you hear about that all the time, the dilemma of needing fuel, but the fuel causing distress. Exactly. So the approach seems to be about training the gut, training the body with, uh, Difficulties, as the physiologist put it, using nutritional strategies in training, not just saving them for race day. Making the body more efficient so it's less reliant on constant external fueling. Killian apparently often trains fasted, which likely contributes to this efficiency. And during UTMB, his strategy wasn't just slamming simple carbs. What else was he using? It included lipids, fats, and also lower glycemic, more fermentable carbs during the less intense parts of the race. To feed the microbiota. Seems like it. Yeah. Support the gut bacteria, maybe encourage that endogenous glucose production via the short chain fatty acids they produce. It's a slower, more sustainable energy release. Interesting. Did they mention things like MCT oil during races? Apparently not during races. Maybe sometimes in recovery, combined with anti-inflammatory foods. And another surprising thing, no caffeine during competition. No caffeine for an ultra runner. That's unusual. It is. It kind of fits with this theme of relying on his innate biological capacity, optimized through training and lifestyle, rather than external stimulants. Which brings us beyond just the pure physiology, doesn't it? There's the whole person. His passion is lifestyle. Definitely. He grew up in the mountains. Training seems driven by personal challenge, not rigid schedules. It's a holistic picture. And his injury record. Pretty low for someone operating at that intensity. Right. Although there was that knee fracture. Generally low injury rate, though that fracture was likely traumatic, you know, an accident. But there's even a potential gut link here. Between gut health and musculoskeletal injuries, how? Inflammation, systemic inflammation, which can be driven by gut issues, dysbiosis, endotoxemia, with his toxins leaking from the gut that inflammation can worsen pain perception and hinder tissue repair and recovery. So a troubled gut could make you more prone to injury or slower to heal. All disease begins in the gut. Modern science is adding layers to that, understanding the gut immune axis. 
So if you're treating an injury or just optimizing training, you really need to consider gut health as part of the picture. It seems increasingly vital. Think about when you're sick, you naturally lose your appetite, right? That might be the body trying to reduce the load on the gut. Maybe you limit that permeability and toxin leakage. Whereas our habit is often to force ourselves to eat, maybe making things worse. Okay, so wrapping this up, Killian Jornet. His incredible physiology seems to be this potent mix of things. Super efficient lactate use, like turning waste into high-octane fuel. 